The text for this morning is the chapter which we have already read together. After the sermon, we'll sing hymn 19, the stanzas 3 and 4. Dear congregation of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, did you notice that in this chapter, a major feature is laughter. The name of Isaac means he laughs. Sarah said at the birth of Isaac, people will laugh over me because they'll be happy for me because I bore this son. And there was also Ishmael's laughter by which he mocked Isaac. It's not the first time that we read about laughter in the book of Genesis. Back in chapter 16 and 17, we read about Abraham and Sarah laughing when God said that they would receive a child. They couldn't believe it. They laughed about it. That can't be true. So there are different kinds of laughter. There's the laughter of joy and faith. There's the laughter of unbelief and mockery. Now the question this morning for us is on this first, fourth Advent Sunday, what kind of laughter fills our hearts as we reflect on the birth of Jesus Christ? And if you're out there listening via live stream and have found this website of the Providence Church, I ask you that question. What do you think about the Christ? Does it fill you with the laughter of joy because we're celebrating his birth in a few days? Or does it fill you with the laughter of unbelief because it just can't be true? Well, this morning I proclaim God's word to you about Christmas in the patriarchal period, the birth of Isaac. And we'll know three things. First of all, rejoicing. Secondly, mockery. And thirdly, encouragement. So the text is about Christmas in the patriarchal period, the birth of Isaac. We know three things. Rejoicing, mockery, and encouragement. The beginning of this chapter sets the tone right at the outset. God is central in all of this. We read that the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. God is central here. Three times that point is made. The Lord visited Sarah. He did to her as he had promised. And she received a son of which God had spoken to Abraham. God is central here. Because this was a tremendous miracle. Abraham was already 100 years old. Sarah was already 90 years old. This was beyond human expectation. And that's why there was so much joy in the tent of Abraham and Sarah when Isaac was born. There was rejoicing because they realized that this did not come from them. This came from God. In fact, God let them wait that long, all those decades, because God wanted it to be absolutely clear that this was his doing. And that was because God was looking way ahead to the time of the birth of Christ. Isaac's birth, in that most miraculous way, beyond human expectation, pointed ahead to the birth of the coming Savior. And it wasn't just that the birth of Isaac was a step on the road to the coming of that Savior in the history of redemption. It was that for sure. But it was more than just a step on the road to the coming of the Christ. 
the birth of Isaac and the way it happened beyond human expectation was prophetic in nature because the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming Savior, would also be totally beyond human expectation. And because the birth of Isaac went way beyond anything that anybody could ever have imagined, there was tremendous rejoicing in the tent of Abraham and Sarah. Their joy was the kind of joy we celebrate at Christmas. And I can say it to you this morning with the words of Isaiah 9, verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And those words from Isaiah about the Christ child would be words that Abram and Sarah could just as well have taken on their lips when they held their little son Isaac in their hands. And it's not a stretch to say that, congregation, because the Lord Jesus Christ himself said at a certain point in his ministry that Abraham was looking far beyond his own time all the way to the time of Jesus Christ. You read it in John chapter 8, verse 56, where our Savior says to God's people of his day, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham saw the day of Christ and the birth of the promised Savior when he held his own newborn son Isaac in his arms. That's why we can say, as someone has said quite rightly so, the birth of Isaac was the celebration of Christmas in the patriarchal church. There was such tremendous joy on the part of Abraham and Sarah. Well, all was not joy because Ishmael was not so happy. As was the custom in those days, Abraham threw a big party when Isaac was weaned. That means when he no longer had to be breastfed. That was a big deal in those days because that was a critical period of time in anybody's life. There was a very high infant mortality rate in Abraham's day. And if a child made it through that period of time, there was a lot of reason for thankfulness. And they often had a celebration. So when Isaac was about three years old and weaned, no longer breastfed, Abraham threw that celebration. And Ishmael would have been about 17 years old. Think back a little bit in the book of Genesis if you're familiar with it. Abraham received Ishmael when he was 86. And he received Isaac when he was 100. So that's 14 years, add three years, Ishmael was 17 years old, so a teenager. And the passage tells us that at this celebration, Sarah happened to see that Ishmael was laughing. But it was not the laughter of joy. It was the laughter of mockery. It was the laughter at the expense of someone. And Sarah understood that. She felt that deep within her. Ishmael knew that Isaac was special. Ishmael knew that he was not the child through which the Lord God was going to work his promises. His mother Hagar would have told him that. How would she not have told him that? And this whole celebration would have been within the context of Abraham's tremendous thankfulness that the promised child survived this period because of God's faithfulness. Ishmael sensed it. He knew it. And he had to acknowledge 
that he had to look outside of himself. He had to look away from himself. He had to look to Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. Ishmael himself had been circumcised too, as God had commanded. He was a covenant child. The promises had come to him. But those promises would go through the line of Isaac. And Ishmael's relationship with God, Ishmael's relationship toward those covenant promises would be dependent upon how he acted toward Isaac. And he had to look outside of himself, away from himself, and to Isaac. So do we. Every time you hear the celebration of the Lord's, you hear the form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, you hear it. We don't look at our own righteousness. We seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ. That's what Ishmael had to do too. He had to focus on the promise. He had to focus on Isaac as that special child. Ultimately, Ishmael had to look toward that promised Savior. Well, we do too. We have to look outside of ourselves to Jesus Christ. That's not always easy. Sometimes we, we like to travel our own path. We like to find our own salvation. We like to live our own life on our own terms and perhaps still confess Jesus Christ as Savior, but on our terms. We can't do that. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, he addressed this. In Galatians chapter 4, 21 to 31, the Apostle Paul says that if we seek anything or anyone instead of or in addition to Jesus Christ then we are walking on the path of the slave woman and her son it's the path of the flesh but says Paul if we focus on Jesus Christ and God's promises as they are centered in Jesus Christ then we are walking on the path of the free woman and the child of the promise it's the way of faith. And that's what we're called to do. But Ishmael refused. Ishmael wanted to go his own way. He did not want to acknowledge Isaac. And did you notice that in this chapter, the name of Ishmael is not even mentioned once. That's significant. He is referred to as the son of Hagar the Egyptian. And that says everything there, said, there is to be said about him. He was the son of Hagar. And that conjures up in our minds what happened way back in Genesis 16 when Hagar conceived a child by Abraham and looked with contempt upon Sarah. And she fled from Sarah because Sarah didn't take that very well. Hagar was filled with contempt toward Sarah. And Ishmael was filled with that same contempt toward Isaac. This is the same spirit. And she... He is also described as the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. The Egyptian. Well, in the Bible, the Egyptians are the enemies of God's people. You know what would happen later in Israel's history. The Egyptians were that oppressive nation. They represented the power of sin. Hostility. And this is why the Apostle Paul also says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 29, that it's the way of persecution. The way of the flesh is the way of persecution. And we hear it like this in Galatians chapter 4, verse 29. Paul says there, At that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. 
And then he says, so also it is now. It was a kind of persecution that Isaac experienced when Ishmael mocked him. And the devil was behind that. Here we see something of that distinction, that division between the seed of the woman on the one hand and the seed of the serpent on the other hand. The devil was behind this. You have the contrast between the laughter of joy that Sarah expressed and the laughter of mockery that Ishmael expressed. And when Ishmael laughed and mocked at Isaac, you, you sensed something of his rage and something of his powerlessness. He couldn't do anything about it. It was a fact. Isaac had been born. It was a fact. Isaac was the child of promise. It was a fact that God's promises would run through the line of Isaac. And there was nothing that he could do about it. He couldn't stop it. And again, that makes us think of the time of Christ. The devil would, would try to prevent the coming of the Christ child into this world. He would display his hostility throughout all those centuries of Israel's history, persecuting the people of God. But he couldn't stop the coming. And you all know that when the Christ was born, Herod tried to kill the Christ child by killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem. That was some time after the birth of Christ. But he couldn't let it go. The devil was behind that. And the Lord Jesus experienced that hostility toward him during the entire course of his public ministry. And Sarah saw what the issue was. She understood in some sense that this was a spiritual struggle. This was not just a teenager upset at his little brother who got a special party. This was a spiritual struggle. And Sarah saw that. And she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman and her son. He's not going to be a co-heir with my son Isaac. Now, there were probably some human aspects to her sentiments. This was the son of Hagar, and she probably still had some hard feelings toward Hagar because of Hagar's earlier contempt toward her. Furthermore, Ishmael, the son of Hagar, was mocking her son, no mother takes that very lightly. There are human elements, but she saw through all of this and saw what was really at stake. Ishmael had to leave. And God said to Abraham, you listen to what Sarah says, because she's right. Because Ishmael rejected Isaac, Ishmael therefore rejected the covenant promises. And because of that, Ishmael himself would be rejected. He had to leave. We would say today, he had to be sent away. He had to be excommunicated. And then there was Abraham, the father. He wrestled with this. We read that. He had a hard time with that to send his son away. That was Ishmael, it was his son. So there was the human element. But God said, no, she's right. And we read that Abraham obeyed. He sent them away because he realized that the promise would come through Isaac. The promise for him, for his household, and also for Ishmael, there was only one way to share in this promise, and that was the way of faith and obedience. And so, Abram sent Ishmael away. And ultimately, 
in the rejection of Isaac, we have to see Ishmael's rejection of the Christ. In Ishmael's mockery of Isaac, we have to see Ishmael's hostility toward the Christ. Another question for us this morning is, what's our attitude toward Christ? What's our attitude? Just as Ishmael's relationship with God would be determined by his relationship and attitude toward Isaac, so our relationship with God is determined by our attitude toward Jesus Christ. So the question during this Advent time is, what do you think of the Christ? Do you believe in him as the promised Savior? Do you look away from yourself and toward Jesus Christ for your well-being and salvation? Well, when Abraham sent Hagar and Ishmael away, they went into the wilderness, and we read that Ishmael almost died. He almost died of thirst. But then the Lord God called out to him. It says, the angel of God called out to Hagar. The angel of God. That's the second person of the Holy Trinity. Pre-incarnate. But did you notice this morning... A very significant little detail. And it may have made you wonder, now who is this angel of God? Because back in Genesis chapter 16, we read about the angel of the Lord. And you might say, well, are they one and the same? Or is this some other angel? They are the same. But the fact that in chapter 21, the angel of God is mentioned. And not the angel of the Lord means that Ishmael had broken the covenant. Because Lord is God's covenant name. Lord is the name that we find in so many places of the Old Testament when God is speaking to his people as their covenant God. But Ishmael had rejected the promises. And so here... It's the angel of God calling to him. He would become a great nation, but he would not share in the promise of the Christ because that comes by grace through faith alone. Well, you can understand, congregation, that this was a time of sadness for Abraham. And we can all relate to that. There was a time of intense rejoicing, the birth of Isaac. But then there was also a time of intense sorrow. The fact that Ishmael had to be sent away. The fact that he rejected the covenant promises. But then we read about Abimelech coming. And there is a connection. Because in chapter 21, verse 22, we read, At that time Abimelech came. To Abraham at that time at the time of Isaac's birth at the time when Ishmael rejected Isaac and the covenant promises at that time Abimelech came and Abimelech came because he saw that God was doing great things for Abraham he could see it the man was successful he was prosperous and beyond any human expectation this elderly man and this elderly woman had received a child. Abimelech saw it. And he came to Abraham and said, I see that the Lord God is with you. God is with you in all that you do. Whereas Ishmael didn't want to see it. Whereas Ishmael spoke slightingly about Isaac. Abimelech came and saw it. And he spoke glowingly to Abraham about what God was doing in Abraham's life. 
Now, Abimelech came out of fear because he wanted to have a covenant treaty established between himself and Abraham in which Abraham would promise that he would never harm Abimelech and his people. But because he was afraid of Abraham, it means that he recognized the God of Abraham at some level. There was some recognition there. More so than by Ishmael. Now Abimelech was not seeking salvation. He was seeking protection. But it is deeply significant that Abimelech came to Abraham because Abimelech was a Gentile. And Abraham could be encouraged by Abimelech's recognition of God's blessing in Abram's life. And Abram could be encouraged by the fact that this Gentile was coming to him and wanted to have peace established. What does that tell us? It tells us that Abraham could see something of the fulfillment of God's promise that through him all the nations would be blessed. Genesis 12 verse 3. There was something of that blessing coming to Abimelech already. It was the beginning of that promise that Abraham would be significant for the whole world. That's why we sang from Psalm 47. In Psalm 47, we read about the nations, the princes coming. Psalm 47, verse 9, the princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. And you see it already in Abram's day. A prince, a king coming to him through whom all the nations would be blessed. And then I think again of Christmas time, the birth of Christ. Sometime after the birth of Christ, the Magi came. Some say they were kings. The Bible doesn't say that. They were wise men. But they were Gentiles. And they came to worship the Christ child. Abimelech was a Gentile, and he came to Abraham because he saw that God was busy in Abram's life. He was blessed, and now he has a son. I can put it to you like this this morning. Isaac's birth was about Christmas. And the arrival of Abimelech was about Pentecost. The nations were starting to come. And this chapter tells us that while Ishmael rejected the covenant promises and had to be cast out, Someone from the nations was already becoming, coming to, to Abraham. And that encouraged Abraham. And we see that encouragement in the fact that he planted a tree. I always find that interesting in this chapter. Abraham planted a tree. Oh, you still do that today. If you walk around in a park... And you pay attention, you'll see there are a lot of trees with a little plaque at the bottom. There's a meaning to that tree. Someone had reason for gratitude and planted a tree in honor of one sort of memory or another. Well, Abraham planted a tree. And within that context, he worshipped the Lord and he spoke about the Lord, the everlasting God. The everlasting God. And that means that God is unchanging. He's everlasting. He's always the same. He's unchanging in his faithfulness. He's unchanging in his power. And Abram experienced it in his own life. He saw God's power. He saw God's faithfulness in the birth of Isaac. And he praised God for it. He is the Lord. 
covenant God. And Abraham worshiped the Lord, the everlasting God, the unchanging God. That meant that his future was secure. The future of his seed, his descendants was secure. And it means that our future is secure. It's secure in Jesus Christ, the promised Savior. And as we worship today on this fourth Sunday of Advent and prepare our hearts to worship on Christmas Day, the question is, what kind of laughter fills our hearts? As we reflect on the coming of the Christ child in the flesh at Bethlehem long ago, may our hearts be filled with the laughter of joy and faith. And may we be encouraged in this dark time. And let all God's people say, Amen.